come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> hey, thanks for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast. We're a uh, movie show, right? We talk about movies every week, whether you're ready for it or not. In our quest for total world domination, all we're asking is a little favor from you that you can go over to wherever you found us and hit that like, subscribe button, uh, give us a review. All that stuff helps us get found by other folks like you. And we want to pay that back because in January, we're having a listener request month. And that means right now this week, jump on over to our social media, wherever you can find us, because we're on uh, Facebook. Facebook.com slash starting a freak show. We're also on Twitter. At Sat Freak Show. Uh, I mean, you can email us your pics. Saturday Night Freak Show at Yahoo.com. Or we're on uh, Instagram at Saturday Night Freak Show. We're going to have a submission uh, there where you can send us movies that you'd like us to cover. What we're going to do, we're going to take all the submissions and we'll, we'll put them in a poll. And we'll, you guys can vote on them for a couple weeks. And then we will pick uh, the top uh, four vote getters. And we'll watch those movies in the month of January. So hop on board the Saturday Night Freak Show Listener Choice Month Express biggest, Train. Our, our, our biggest concern is that we that is it available for us to watch somewhere. That yeah, is our yes. biggest request. If we can track it down, yeah. Uh, you're probably wondering who these people are who are talking to you right now. They're the internet radio superstars. Holly. Michaela. Sean. And I'm Colin. And tonight we watched a movie that was chosen by... Colin. Colin, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Holly. <laughs> Michaela, Merry Christmas. And Colin, what did you too. pick as your Christmas pick for this year? Oh, shit. I'm was just going to label it as that. Yeah, it's maybe. Christmas-y. I don't it's know. There's, we... white, there's red and green in this movie. Yeah, I haven't looked there's at our schedule. There's a miracle at one point. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, don't shoot your eye out. Uh, we watched uh, The Curse of Frankenstein. From the year. 1957. Ooh, directed by? Terrence Fisher. House mm-hmm. director we know Terrence for... Fisher? Uh, yeah, we did uh, his movie, uh, The Curse of the Werewolf, uh, also this uh, year. Um, but basically, Terrence Fisher was the house director for Hammer Films, England's Hammer didn't Films. Didn't he? Uh, didn't he direct like every Frankenstein movie, Hammer Frankenstein movie, but one? Oh, really? Actually, I, I'm I'm not sure because I know um, who was it? Freddie Francis. Freddie Francis, who went on to be like a great cinematographer, he worked with uh, David Lynch and. Uh, uh he directed glory right freddie francis oh, okay. uh he... so are all of his movies just the curse of no whatever <laughs> <laughs> no i think there's only two actually there's the curse of frankenstein curse of the werewolf the rest of them have uh other titles which we'll get into here but um terrence terrence fisher directed uh one, one two three four five five of the first six of the hammer frankenstein movies Oh, really? Wow. So he only missed yeah. uh, the Freddie Francis one. That would be Evil of Frankenstein. Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Is that the is that the one that uh, Peter Cushing was not in? No, that's uh, the Horror of Frankenstein from uh, 1970, which that's why I don't really count that one, because it's uh, Ralph Bates. It's basically a remake of the one we just watched. It's uh, and, It retells the and, story. And it looks like it's directed by the guy who wrote this movie. Jimmy Sangster. Jimmy Sangster. There you go. Who also wrote like a whole shitload of the uh, the Hammer films. So mm-hmm. if you were a longtime listener of this show, we've covered a bunch of Hammer movies because they're a favorite of mine. <laughs> um, what is my obsession with Hammer movies? Well, I you know I think I'm trying to come back. At like you know when you're a horror fan and a monster fan, eventually you know you're going to run into Hammer. Uh, the British outfit that arose in the uh, actually they're from like the 1920s or 30s, but they got their start um, or really got on the map with a movie called the Quatermass Experiment, which was um, a feature film version of a popular British sci-fi TV show that kind of predated Doctor Who, right? And then they did Quatermass Two. These movies were released here in the United States with different names, like The Creeping Unknown and. Uh, what was the second one called? I can't even remember what the mm, creeping unknown. Yeah, 
Um, I, think, I think Quatermass in the Pit was one of my first episodes. Yeah, that's the third. That's the third of yeah. the Quatermass. And that came significantly later after the other two. But um, uh, but anyway, in 1957, right, The um, they were presented as... Okay, so this is a little bit of history. It also ties back into some of the other movies that we've talked to. But these guys named... Uh, I think it was the writer Milton Sabotsky, right? It, came to hammer with a script called Frankenstein and the monster. And he said, Hey, why don't you guys do a Frankenstein movie? And so the hammer, this guy hammers, uh, you know, it's like, yeah, well, I mean, is it, uh, you know, can you do that? Right. There's universal movies that are Frankenstein. And they said, yeah, but there's a book, right? Like you can base it on the book. It doesn't actually have to be based on, but they're like, but you can't use any of the stylistic, you know, the makeup. Right. Design no that, imagery. None of that. Yeah. Yeah, there ain't nothing that looks like Boris Karloff. You got to come up with something completely different, right? So, anyway, something happened, and I'm not sure. What. <laughs> so they gave him a bowl cut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he, he does. <laughs> he looks a lot different in this movie. The monster does. Yeah. Um, but Tom, he also has a nice double-breasted pea coat too. He has a, a great nice coat. coat. Yeah, I know. He's definitely the coat. best dressed Frankenstein, right? Um. Yeah, I mean, it, you consider what, like, uh, uh, Robert yes, De Niro's, sorry. like, he's got that big flowing. Yeah, no, I like this one I better, I think. Uh, yeah, this one's better. It's like, it's, it's, uh, English Moors, we'll call it. That's what we'll call that style. It is, but it's also kind of timeless because I have a coat like that now. Like, that's a look that uh, still exists. Oh, yeah. Few coats are just forever. Forever, see, forever. Your next Halloween costume idea forming right now. <laughs> yes. I already have half of it. So, um, well, anyway, they, so, they got rid of uh, Sabotsky's script, um, and then they ended up hiring Jimmy Sangster to do the movie. So this maybe uh, be, became a point of contention at some point. They bought Sabotsky out. He ended up forming uh, Amicus Films with yeah. uh, his partner, uh, Max Rosenberg, and they became like Hammer's competition. <laughs> I don't know if it was because of this uh, this moment in history. <laughs> right? Not. Like, fuck you. I'll make my own studio. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, and I guess both Terrence Fisher and Jimmy Sangster had never seen the Universal Frankenstein movie. Really? Oh. Yeah. When did when did the Universal's Frankenstein come out? What year? Uh, the Boris Car the original movie came out in nineteen thirty one. Uh, Thirty one. Okay. I was trying so to track back, like, well, when? But it must have been available in like re releases or whatever, right? Sure. And I found a re-release in 1937, and there was a re-release in 1947. Um, right. So that would be 10 years prior to this. And in between there, obviously, Universal had a series of monster movies, but the last one was Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein, and that was 1948. So now it's been it's been nine years since the public has seen a Frankenstein movie at this point, 1957. Mm. All of them have been in black and white. Right, yes, and most have. movies are being made in black and white at this period of time. Uh, so Hammer decides to go all out, spend some money, and make a big color um, Frankenstein movie, um, and it paid off because apparently this movie became, uh, I think, for a while, it held the record as the most financially successful British movie, uh, you know, produced by a British studio for like a number yes. of years. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um and so this was uh this was Hammer's first color after so long in black and white. This was their first color feature. Yeah, cuz I think have you seen um The Abominable Snowman? With I Peter have. Cushing? You have. That's black yes. and white, right? Yes. Okay, and that came out the same year as this. Um Oh, okay. And that sounds like it would have been a good Christmas pick, Colin. Yeah, I know. I know. I, I it's actually it. <laughs> not bad. Yeah. <laughs> well, Hammer, you know, I mean, obviously the, the success of this movie, they went all into horror and all in on the, you know, redoing remakes of the classic monsters. There were six total Frankenstein movies that they did based on this movie. Peter Cushing would go on to play the, the doctor in five of those. Um, we should we give him some titles because then the one he, he, there's uh, the Revenge of Frank. The next one, right? Next one's Revenge. Then uh, the, uh, Created Women's the fourth one. Yeah, the Evil of Frankenstein's the third ah, one, which actually right. they got permission from Universal. Universal put that one out, so they were able to what? use uh, some version of the 
Which one is Frankenstein Takes Manhattan? Which is that one? Coming soon from Hammer. Would watch. (laughs) Definitely would watch. I mean, yeah, would watch. Frankenstein in space, right? Yeah. Sure. Holly, so what happens in his montage of when he's first on the street? Obviously, Mm -hmm. goes to Times Square. He's in all of it. Does he get a hot dog? (laughs) I say he he finds some break dancers and starts break dancing. he goes to a timeless New York pizza joint called Sabaros. <laughs> Does he learn how to fold it in half? Obviously. Favorite New York slice. <laughs> we should make it. Why hasn't somebody done it? They probably have. I don't know. I mean, it's now I want to see him in Times Square. I just do. Yeah. I want to see him like at the Statue of Liberty with the phone, the foam crown on his head. Right. Actually, I shit, uh, we uh, have seen this. Uh, you just last year, uh, the New York uh, independent filmmaker Larry Fessenden made a movie called Depraved, and it is it's the Frankenstein. It's his version of the Frankenstein story, updated. Wow. And of course, at some point, the monster gets out and he's running around New York and going to no museums idea. and stuff. Yeah, it's a pretty Holly, good movie. You you check s- that one out. Holly, I want to see right. him go to Washington Square Park and jump in the Friends Fountain. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Yay! <Fingers> Splash across. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the other movies in the series were uh, after Evil of Frankenstein. There was Frankenstein Created Woman, right? Because uh, Roger Vandam had done and God Created Woman with Bridget Bardot, and so. Mm. Uh, and then there was the uh, Frankenstein Must Be Destroyed. Uh, the horror of Frankenstein is the one with Ralph Bates that doesn't count. And the final one was 1974, and that was Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell. Trivia for you. Uh, we just lost the actor David Prowse this week as we're recording this. Uh, he obviously played, was famous for playing Darth Vader in Star Wars. But David Prowse, uh, he played Frank and the Monster twice in two Hammer Frankenstein movies. He was in uh, Horror of Frankenstein and Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell. So there you go. Hmm. May he rest nice. in peace. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He's a big guy too. So this movie has uh, Peter Cushing in it. Um, this is a departure from uh, what you, I assume, like the way that you assume uh, the character of Doctor Frankenstein is going to be um, presented. Or no? Did you expect this? What were you thinking? I mean, he's um, always been a mad scientist. So I, like- I mean. Honestly, if, if I hear Peter Cushing is playing Frankenstein, this is what I imagine. I don't think it was far off from what we usually get. Yeah, for, it's a, it's a mad scientist doctor. in a castle. It's yeah, pretty straightforward. Mm-hmm. Well, it was just, uh, you know, it's comparison to like the Colin Clive version where he's kind of, you know, the driven guy who... The idea that Colin Clive's Frankenstein, and I think in the book too, it's like he's he's a moral man who's you know uh, led astray by his uh, single minded pursuit of you know it's like only I can do this thing, and I'm motivated to do this thing that's going to change the world, and he loses sight of everything else around him, gets rid of friends and family and everything, so he can single mindedly pursue this goal. But Peter Cushing's Frankenstein, I think, is different than that. Um, this guy's a fucking raging sociopath, if not a psychopath, <laughs> right? Like he gives absolutely no fucks about anybody around him. He will uh, manipulate them. He yes, will, he does not care. Yeah, and yeah, and, I think I, I think that's the biggest difference for me is you know if you if you've read the uh, the original book or even seen some of the other um, portrayals of it, like you do have a feeling about Victor Frankenstein. You you're almost saddened to watch his descent. You're like, you you were better than this. And to watch him like grow more obsessive. If you actually feel things watching that, whereas this, I'm just like, what the fuck? Like, what am I supposed to feel for this dude? Cause I feel nothing for him. Well, <laughs> I don't know if that was a hatred choice and contempt or if it was or... written that way. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't know. I I felt dislike for him. He was, um, I mean, he's just a fucking, he's a rat bastard in this movie and in several of the sequels. um, Yes. In one of them. The next one, he's a rat bastard as well, I believe. Yeah. Uh, In one of them, they do try to give him a little bit of a sympathetic thing where I think it's evil of Frankenstein. They basically, you know, it's like he's the genius who's trying to do this stuff in the villagers don't understand it. And why don't they just leave me alone? You know, don't they understand the work that I'm doing? And it kind of changes his character a little bit, but I mean, most of these, and I think that was a big departure from what the audiences that it come to expect of, uh, you know, Dr. Frankenstein. 
was that this guy was just like he's the villain <laughs> you know right it's not the monster it's the doctor this psychopathic nut job. <laughs> well, not, I mean, that was that was always the that was always the question about the book too, though. Who's the who's the actual villain? Is it Doctor Frankenstein or is it the monster? So I don't I, I don't think that is quite a huge leap. That's that's pretty standard for the story. Well, but it takes away like every single redeemable quality that a character could have. I mean, at every point he's like you know, you know. At, at, so at some point, you know, I mean, so basically. Um, he grows up in this house. His parents die, right? He leaves him. He's the Baron. He hires a tutor, this guy named Paul Kremp, who comes in to tutor him, and then uh, they become colleagues in these, uh, uh, you know, um, experiments. And which I was thinking about. Can you imagine if you're a tutor and the kid you're tutoring is also your boss? <laughs> yeah, that would suck. <laughs> He's paying your bills. There's no way that ends well. Right? It just That's doesn't. I'm, I'm like, this is I said two plus two it. is five. <laughs> <laughs> You're fired. This yes. kid's an asshole, by the way. I he hate is. this kid. Total asshole. Yeah, but th this yes. is, they, they, they cast that kid like perfect. I mean, perfect. not only does he look like Peter Cushing, but he has the same like haughty, know it all. Yeah. As yeah, he's the, got a punchable face. He well, does have a punchable face. Put him on the Hall of Fame of Saturday Night Freak Show punchable faces. Yeah. Does does MF Ed, does MF Mad keep track of that? Our punchable wall. <laughs> <laughs> we got. Uh, it's the brother from Teen Witch, and uh, there was someone yeah, else. Yeah, Joshua Miller, and I can't yeah. remember who else was. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that kid from uh, Near Dark. Yeah, yeah that's who Miller. I'm talking about. Yeah. Is that yeah, what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He's the kid. number one. It's going to be hard to dethrone him. Oh, oh, um, 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 uh, Dylan, um, fucking hell. What's his name? Dylan, apparently. His, his last name is Dylan. Uh, Bob oh, Dylan? Kevin Dylan? Yes, that's okay. Kevin uh, Dylan. Yeah. Kevin Dylan, yes. Ah, uh, yeah. picking on that French Kevin coat. <laughs> yeah. Um... But yeah, but he, he keeps compounding this because, like, he's got an arranged marriage, I guess, to his cousin... Elizabeth, right? Yeah, yeah, he does. Pretty standard for back then. Yes, but he pays her pretty much no mind. Uh, so this doesn't endear you to him, right? I mean, like I think the night that she shows up, he's like, "I've got business in the, you know, uh, in the lab. You go on yes. to dinner, and I'll I'll talk." We'll to you see later. you at dinner. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's very polite, very charming. He's not very polite. That part bugged the shit out of me. I'm sorry. He's got this, what do we call him, a beaker buddy? He's got this beaker buddy that he's playing in the lab with every fucking day, and he couldn't mention that his cousin is coming to live there? You're dissolving body parts in an acid bath. You should probably tell him that there's, an, there's a woman moving in with you. Probably tell him. <laughs> uh, by the way, this is my cousin whom I will marry. Yeah. Yeah. She just shows yeah. up one day. Did Victor never tell you about me? No. Is it focus? Not a word. He's got <laughs> this focus. He talks more about the dead body than you. Or, or <laughs> is this a manipulative? Uh, like, is he manipulating people by intentionally withholding this information? Every second. Do you think so? Every, I, I think he manipulates <laughs> all the time. Well, you were I saying think he is absent-minded and, and somewhat and doesn't pay attention to stuff like you I, said. He's see, driven. That, yeah, that's that's where I'm. That's where I debate because part of me is like I think it's purposeful i think he's very specific with his manipulation but on the other hand i think he literally just doesn't give a shit and doesn't think about it yeah. i think he's in his mind that's not important so why would he bring it up yeah i think yes. i think that's where i came down on it too it's like it's just it's not that important and it's you know a minor detail <laughs> you know yeah, and she'll it's not, move it's in a major and, detail you yeah she's bitch. gonna take major care of the detail. house she'll invite people to the wedding it's like i don't really have to deal with any of that but you know it's like but there was a scene that we were kind of talking about in our group chat, and I'm kind of curious, you know, going back to it where, you know, where it is now, having seen the whole movie, um, you know, because she's like, well, Victor, I'll help you out in your research or, you know, let me into your lab or let me see it. And he's like, well, maybe one day. And uh, I was asking at that point in time, do you actually think that he because, uh, you know, you can read that either way. It's like, well, one day you're going to be a piece of meat on my slab, you know. Uh, material for my experiment or he legitimately thinks that at some point he'll be able to replace paul or she'll take his you know she'll be his wife in these experiments 
I, I don't think he's fully 100% decided yet, but I think I can see both options flash across his yeah. face through I, his eyes right I there. Can, it's like, maybe when I move on to women, I could use you. Yeah, I can see him being like, oh, she's beautiful. She'd be a fine specimen. And I can also see him being like, oh, she could be someone that I can share my genius with, that she can tell me how brilliant I am. You know, I can see that going either way. Maybe he was thinking ahead to like, I can make you into the bride. Mm hmm. Something. I think he's just looking at her like, I'd love to see what your brain looks like. I think that could go either way. <laughs> well, there's Thank a you, number Sean. of points Thank like you. later on in the movie. I mean, because that's, uh, you know, the thing. Uh, he wants oh, me for my brain. <laughs> <laughs> uh hazel court is the actress who uh who plays uh elizabeth she was also later in um the uh aip uh poe movie she was in with vincent price the roger corman movie she was in mm -hmm. uh mask of the red death and uh premature burial we should say that all those edgar Allan poe movies are the american response to the gothic horror reinvention uh, that Curse of Frankenstein uh, brought because I, I don't know if we I said it on the show yet, but you know horror was out of favor when this movie came out, and we were in the era now of the uh, atomic monster, right? Because I think the uh, World War II and the, the atomic bomb had kind of uh, changed the way that people thought about you know this kind of gothic horror was was uh, old hat, and yep. there's actually if you watch the movie with that frame of reference in mind you know that this is kind of going on in society when uh frankenstein brings this uh old german guy over to his house and they sit down and have this conversation and we know that frankenstein's actually like auditioning a brain here because he needs a brain yes. for his right but there's a conversation that they have about science and like what our responsibility is as science and our you know, discoveries are then taken by other people and, and, you know, twisted and become these other things. He's talking about nuclear uh, proliferation or the, the uh, Oppenheimer, you know, <laughs> the, the creation of the atomic bomb. I think, you know, this is a contemporary movie making a, a comment on that, but it's kind of interesting just how that, you know, they bring that in there. Um, so the other thing that Frankenstein does to, uh, to kind of turn the audience against him. That's what I'm saying. They're not, they are working against you liking this guy at all. He's also fucking the maid. <laughs> Indeed he is. <laughs> right. And, but he's given her, why not? He's given her a line of shit too. Uh, you know, I'll she, matter you, <laughs> but she has no intent or plans to do this. Um, yeah. But yeah, so he's carrying on an affair with a maid, bringing this other woman in who he's going to marry, uh, not telling either one of them about each other. Of course, this is going to go bad, like for somebody in the final act. Um, <laughs> uh, and then he's, you know, got uh, his helper, Paul, is helping him with these experiments. But as always the case in these kind of things, like at some point, there's a moral line, which, uh, you know, somebody's like, what the hell are you like? This is just completely outside of the pale of uh ethical behavior and so what uh i mean we get to that with paul um uh what's his line colin like we 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 start off with um uh what's their experiment uh to bring the dog back to life the small puppy they have this is the frank first and like yes frank and puppers <laughs> this is the first in like frank in Lee. laboratory um yeah uh, in laboratory experiment we see them doing they're successful on, at that and this is kind of what triggers um they've always had this idea um uh, paul uh his assistant has mentored him throughout the years up until the point where they both become the same age somehow um and then eventually he becomes older than paul <laughs> right and i was gonna say i'm just like how he's up a hairline of a man who's 10 <laughs> years older than paul <laughs> But they end up, uh, their experiment works. They bring a puppy back to life. Which is the perfect setup for a crossover with Zoltan. Yes. Dracula's dog. <laughs> with, with vampire puppies. You know, I was thinking about puppies. that, right? They have to, like, breed mastiffs, and then those go to Dracula, and they end up guarding Dracula's tomb or something like that. But you couldn't have the hammer, uh, like, shared monster universe, because uh, Peter Cushing 
was, uh, you know, <laughs> he was Dr. Frankenstein in one, and he was Van Helsing in the other. So you can't. Right. <laughs> you're like, well, what? Put a beard. Put a beard on one, and then you're good. Like, I'm I don't just see talking about purely a movie about the dogs. I just want yeah, to see just, the dogs versing each other. I just want the animals. Oh, they're fighting. I thought they were friends. I mean, they could meet up thinking they're going to fight, and then it's like a Twilight situation where they're like, wait, we all have a common goal, and then they don't Yeah, fight. we all have a mom named Martha. Got it. I'm in. Yeah. yeah. Hey, this could I still happen because... Be Puppies really of it. Martha. <laughs> <laughs> they are remaking Van Helsing, so, I mean... Why did you bark that name? <laughs> um, <laughs> dumb. Dumb. Very dumb. Uh, <laughs> but... <laughs> Sean, we all left. Mm-hmm. Very true. The solid. But you're absolutely right, Sean. That's the thing that gives them the idea that, like, hey, we should actually be creating a being instead of just restoring life to. Because uh... actually, that's the thing. Paul is kind of in the mind mode of like, we can use this technology to uh, help people who are dying yes. and all that. But uh, Frankenstein's like, no, we got to create a monster because you know that's what you we do. Must we, we yeah. must build. We must build. So, um, you know, there's the usual shots of uh, uh, going to, you know, charnel houses. Okay, so actually, this is it's not. Well, usual. where do they get the body? Yeah. Uh, well, hanging off the gibbet, uh, which uh. is the term for the uh, whatever scaffolding, right? That uh, you hang the people arm. on it. Yeah. They used to. That was for you guys. Yeah, we we're hanging hand dude. Hand puppets you. here huh? on I our Zoom. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> the gibbet. Cut him down from the gibbet. I love it when you do that. Um the I guess this isn't really true. I was gonna say, like, you know, these are the perfunctory scenes of, you know, uh uh organ um harvesting, right? Which always seems to happen in this. This is uh, again, I think the whole Frankenstein thing comes from you know the Burke and Hare thing. It's like, well, these medical guys do use and experiment on uh, cadavers and these are illegal, you know, experiments. So they're digging up bodies. Nobody digs up a body in this one. Um, but he does procure, yeah. uh, you know, the hanging body off the gibbet, and then he also brings home a couple of severed hands. Mm, the hands of a is it a pianist or, or what, yeah, what are the, the hands of a pianist? Yep, because <sighs> he wants uh, he's trying to make a uh, you know pianist uh, Holly. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Pianist and peanuts. It is, you know, those, oh, those words. <laughs> yeah. 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 The annual peanut sale. <laughs> yes. That's um, for you local people. <laughs> the uh and eventually an eyeball, you know, he's got to get a couple of eyeballs. So this is okay. So I have been uh looking at horror movies my entire life, right? This is why I think this one is somewhat significant because I think that I've tracked it back. I think Curse of Frankenstein is the first like blood and guts movie in color. Um, I, Cause I don't know if that uh, I've seen anything really before this uh, that actually uses, I mean, there's a shot where uh, the monster gets shot in the eye later and blood like kind of gushes out, you know, Frankenstein at mm-hmm. some point makes a um, deal of wiping blood on his coat, which to mm-hmm. us is like, so what? But to them it was like, Oh shit, that's red gore yeah. on a coat you know close-ups of what looked like fake severed hands but i think at the time we're like you know there's organs in dishes and stuff like that which i think right. to the audience of the time was fairly shocking and revolting you know it was like so this so you're saying this was the wizard of oz of horror is what you're telling me of of gore movies yeah i mean because i mean herschel gordon lewis made blood feast in in the early 60s so i think he was inspired kind of by like this leeway of a place you could go and that was probably part of the attraction of seeing the movie it's like they're showing stuff in this movie that like hasn't ever been seen before um eyeballs and color yeah i mean unless you go with what the salvador dali uh movie what's that on yeah where you know there's a with the cut eyeball and everything yeah, yeah which is from like the 20s but um I think as yeah, far as like yeah. major film, you know, color gore, and I'm not saying right. this is a bloodbath or anything, but um, but enough. Know. And how often now? I, I'm not as familiar with uh, Universal's horror line um, or what happens in those. How in the creation of Frankenstein? It's been, it's been a long time since I've seen it. How during the collection of body parts, like. Is, is that even a thing? Are we shown? Does he just say he got them together? I'm I'm missing this part of Frankenstein lore. Like how 
I mean, he cuts a couple heads off in this movie. Mm -hmm. Like, how even close to graphic do the earlier Frankenstein ones get? Can't be. It's nothing like this. The um, early one has like a grave robbing scene where, uh, you know, you see them digging. I mean, that's basically mm -hmm. your image, you know, yeah. and then they, uh, it's basically they harvest one body. That's mm -hmm. it. Yeah. But I think they they speak of, you know, if sewn together, you know, right. Um, that's uh, wondering. I wonder how much is spoken of versus how much we end up seeing in this movie his collection of particular pieces. Yeah. I, I, cause I'm even trying to think like the later, uh, Frankenstein movies. I know that in the first one, I mean, that, that I can remember they do, you see a, a brain in a glass, you know, jar filled with fluid that, uh, Fritz drops, you know, the hunchback assistant mm. drops it and then he gets the abnormal brain and then they rift on that and young Frankenstein. Uh, so I know there's a brain in a jar, you know, mm -hmm. but as far as like other body parts right now, I can't call an image to mind from even the later, um, later entries from universal. So this, I think was uh, fairly shocking, shocking enough to the point where the British censor said rated X, but X back then meant no one under 16 admitted, um, oh. But it was a certificate X, which was always kind of ironic because, like, when these movies would open in the United States, they were marketed to kids. And Britain was right. like, no kids allowed. This is uh, transgressive, horrible stuff. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. So uh, he sews this all together and creates his monster. Um, you know what I was actually thinking? Like, when Mary Shelley wrote the book, there wasn't. Um, have, you, have any guys read? Uh, the Frankenstein. Do you remember Holly? Oh yes, the I adapted it. Oh, did you? Yeah, for oh, yeah. was that one of them? My job, yeah. Okay, well then, this is so. a question for everybody. Then, like, how well do you remember the creation sequence in uh, the the novel Frankenstein? I read Frankenstein in high school. I do not remember that book. <laughs> I mean, I I don't remember how detailed it got. I mean, that book came out in eighteen. 18 i think yeah so i don't remember how graphic it really got i think eh. it doesn't at all i'll tell you yeah. <laughs> it's a, it basically oh. says and through my methods i breathed the spark of life into the creature <laughs> yeah i was like i don't remember but i can't imagine it was very detailed at all <laughs> yeah That's i don't even think I they wouldn't get detailed because it's not there it's not yeah. there the yeah. whole idea that we kind of have of, uh, you know, lightning brings, you know, Frankenstein is somehow a creature of lightning uh, was created by the, the well, maybe the Thomas Edison 20s version of Frankenstein or the universal sure. Frankenstein. But even in this one, um, you know, I was keen on how much electricity kind of played a part in bringing the creature to life. Um but primarily, you know, because electricity is the thing in the 31, you know, there's uh, Jacob's ladders going off and, yeah. you know, all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All that classics. I love it. But yeah, this one. The classic mad laboratory. This one goes with, uh, as you said, beaker science. Beaker Beakers science. and levers, yes. <laughs> <laughs> We've established Beakers. blinking light science, flip switching science. Now we have beaker science. That's right. Mm -hmm. Put that down on your uh, Saturday All night Fringo. Yes. Free show. Beaker Fringo science is very card. colorful. It yeah. is. <laughs> well, you're making a movie. It's in the color. most visually pleasing type of science, I think. Right. As long as we got like some blue thing bubbling in the background, we're good to go. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the thing. It's there's, there's a lot going on. There's bubbles. There's like there's smoke. There's lots. There's of tubes. There's tubes. It's a big sensory experience. Yeah. yeah. Sound. You got visuals. It's it's a it's a nice levers. ambiance. <laughs> I love all the levers. I love yeah. a good yeah. lever. But unfortunately. Because he's been working with Paul all these years, he designed the thing to be a uh, team effort. It's got to be dual operated. And since Paul has basically said, like, uh, no, I'm not helping you with this. This is uh, is awful. Why doesn't Paul just leave? If he if he says such a moral objection to this whole thing, why doesn't he just take off? Women. It's just women. <laughs> I mean... That's all I got. It's just women. It's it's Elizabeth, the the cousin wife, has come to live with uh, at the place, and he's and he fears for what might happen to her should he leave. Does Paul have a crush on Elizabeth? Yes, which is fine because she's yeah. not his cousin. 
Yeah. <laughs> That's true. This is a better match. I know. I no. just watched The Godfather 3 the other day. It's like, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, cousin cousin love. First cousin love. So like, what's going <laughs> don't, on? Oh, just don't say, uh, cousin, <laughs> don't say cousin love. I don't want to um, <laughs> I think she's kind of got the hots for him. He shows up at the door one time. And she's like, oh, it's Paul. Paul. Paul should be here. But like, this is never addressed in the movie. All this like unspoken below the surface uh, sexual tension Unspoken thing yeah it starts, <laughs> it starts from the beginning like as soon as they meet there's like oh there's something there you can tell yeah well probably because of victor's like total disinterest in like anything other than he's got one thing on his mind yeah and, you ignore your wife she's gonna go find someone who's not ignoring her yeah but ironically he is fucking the maid so he's got the action on the side so he's okay there yeah. um I hate him. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> no, he's he's not a good guy. He no. continues to be not a good guy. I know. The movie works, I think, in that way. It's like, man, he is despicable. I mean, like, just fucking evil, <laughs> this guy. Yeah, he is. There's a, there's a sentence at the end of this movie, which is, like, he stays bad to the end. And when he's talking to Paul, Paul meets him at the end. And Paul's like, what happened? And he's like, the creature I created killed him. And then Paul looks like, don't you see what you're saying? You are responsible for this. Even if the ki- if the monster killed it, you are the monster, mm-hmm. which yeah. I thought was great. It's a great kind of end to that point. It worked, yeah. yeah. That scene when, he, when he's talking to the maid and she's like, you're supposed to marry me. And he starts laughing at her. I about threw my remote across the room. I was so angry. Mm-hmm. It was disgusting. Me? Marry you? <laughs> you fool. Yeah, I mean, he's <laughs> contemptuous. Holly, that sounds, like, <laughs> that sounds like the contempt of someone who's been on dating apps for a while. I'm not anymore. <laughs> Fuck that, <I'm> John. <laughs> I mean, I, I feel the same contempt, but yes. Oh, well, we actually, we forgot to say, uh, uh, so where does he eventually get this brain? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. He uh, well, like you said earlier, he was auditioning brains and uh, uh, a professor. <laughs> he was. Yeah, he's just holding brain microphones triads. up to actual brains with just eyeballs. <laughs> like it's that brain with eyeballs from Robocop, too. It's just yeah. that. Mm-hmm. He was brain um, but- dating, wasn't he? He yeah. was. He's like, mm, you're fascinating. Sean, I was more picturing the like the the Paul Walker brain at the end of Tammy and the T-Rex. <laughs> There we go. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Whichever one sparks more is the one I'm going to put in my Frankenstein monster. <laughs> um, he's interviewing brains, and he invites over an old professor who they were having conversations with. Um, he was in, invites him to stay the night, and so <laughs> he takes him to his room, and he's like, "So I'd like you to just look at this picture that I was talking about earlier, and maybe it'd be better if you stood back a little bit." And he's like, "No, professor!" And then he pushes him off a balcony. Uh, intent on killing him to eventually harvest his brain. Now, it is at this point that we kill a man uh, yeah. on film. Yeah. I was going to say, that part, <laughs> that part made uh, me laugh, the way he pushed him, and then I saw him hit the ground. I was like, oh, that stuntman actually died just now. Yeah, he's There's dead. a lot of stuntman abuse in this movie. At the end, too, I was like, oh! Yeah, that's what I love about these movies. No, these guys know what they're getting in for, but it's like, I hope you were paid well because that guy landed on his face. He falls like two stories or whatever, story and a half, and lands face first on. Well, we can tell that it's a mat. I think you know. Sure, uh, but uh, from what I from what I read, he missed the mat. Oh Jesus! <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I, his head hit the mat. I, feel like, I think his body I feel did. Like back then, unless you were top billing, you did not get paid well, regardless. Mm. Like nobody got paid well. Right, and to like to suppress your natural instincts to put your arms out to catch you is like a really difficult thing to do. I can't imagine that. Yeah, for a low yeah, budget it's movie, it's an impressive stunt. Like it feels violent. You know, it's like yes. fuck. He just pushed because it's this old guy. You know, he just pushed this old guy to his death, and we see it. Like holy shit! Yeah, yeah. old dude landed on his head, which you know you figure you don't want to do if you're trying to you know keep the brain intact. But you know whatever. <laughs> right. Um, that's fine. Shoves him off. He's dead. Then he's like, you know, well, the least I could do, he died in my house. So I'll have him buried in my, uh, you know, in my personal, uh, vault. Right. So he can get at him later and cut his head open and crack that skull, the melon and take the brain out. Um, yes. but then, yeah. So this also creates like a further conflict. Cause Paul comes in and is like, I can't prove that you killed him. 
but I can keep you from using his brain. And they get into a fight, and of course the brain gets damaged. Um, we see Frankenstein later, like, pulling with tweezers, pulling glass, broken glass of the, the canister out of the brain. Like, oh, that's, well, this, it'll be fine. You just take the little pieces of glass out of it. It'll be, it'll be okay. Roll. It's fine. Yeah, you can use it. Um, Because then this becomes like a thing. You know, Frankenstein's all like, uh, this is all your fault, you know, Paul. You're saying it's my fault for creating it. It's your fault that it has a damaged brain. It's your fault because you shoot him in the eye later. It's your fault that, you know. So he's always deflecting all this. You know, it's like my my creation would have been perfect if it would have been my creation. Typical Mm. sociopath. Always blame shifting. Yeah. Uh, but they do they do bring the creature to life and we should say the creature is played by christopher lee um another name along with peter cushing would be synonymous with hammer movies he obviously went on to be the lead star in dracula uh and then he did his dracula series he was dracula and god knows like eight movies or so um and then did you know even they were in sherlock holmes they were in all sorts of stuff he was fu manchu for a while and you know i mean like just these guys were inseparable and for a period of about i don't know 20 30 years were like you know the do the horror duo that you knew like peter cushing and christopher lee it's a scary movie you know i feel like in this movie you really get a sense of how tall he is i forget how tall christopher lee was in real life but like he's, he's usually like a robe or like a cloak or something so it's kind of hard to see but we're just wearing this like form fitting coat in this movie yeah he's really fucking tall Mm-hmm. yeah yeah because they're yeah. designing him to be like this lanky you know um character his makeup is very different than the boris karloff makeup um it's ghoulish in what way it's he's very pale and it's i don't know there was something about the makeup that was almost scaly i don't know if that's the right word he's but got like boils and stuff yeah like, he looks almost like a like bird his- victim it's kind of it, well. It feels like his face is going to slide off at any moment. Yes. Like it's just not on there tight. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's like, Ugh. and he's got that one cataract eye, uh, which yes. is a fact I kind of like. But he's got scars, you know, and yeah. a bowl cut. It, yeah, an unfortunate bowl <laughs> cut. Um, it is kind of like you know the the Kenneth Brana Frankenstein later did some like a more realistic version of this, right? Where right know, eventually because he had the mismatched eyes and the scars, but eventually they healed. Yeah. And, um. I like the pseudoscience of the time, which I'm not entirely sure now, you know, uh, I don't know enough about the subject um, to be able to say if this was something that was in the zeitgeist in 1957 or they were writing, you know, a story that takes place in the 1800s. Um, Frankenstein's whole thing is like, don't worry about the scars on his face. It's all about the character, uh, a, a, a decent person will have their features will basically come to match you know a wise uh, a wise man will have a wise face you know it'll mm. match and the, you know the scars will heal and he'll adopt this and an evil person you know they get like an evil looking face i'm like wow that's uh you're dooming a lot of people to <laughs> to lives of crime i guess that way that's why yeah. i'm almost like this is like 1957 that's like contemporary for that uh period of time um so the monster of course does eventually break loose as they are wont to do in these movies and gets loose in the countryside what mayhem does he get up to blind grandpa he's always a blind man frank it's right? like a thing you got to do the yeah does he kill that kid that the grandpa's with yes okay you're saying that but what evidence do you have of that all we get is the uh, the little fishing bag, as we see, um, has been uh, strewn onto the ground and has been opened. So either he stole that thing and ate those fish from that kid, or he killed that fucking kid. I think he killed the kid. I think he killed the kid. I think uh, your rating sensor at the time was like, there was no way in hell that you were going to go uh, that there. Um, no. So it is... I think, you know, you know, as a modern viewer, I was sitting there going like, man, they, they don't show anything. It's just the kid wanders into the woods and we fade out. But I think the implication of maybe the audience in 1957 would have been keen enough to pick up on it. It's like uh, what you're saying is the monster also killed the kid. Uh, right. You just can't show it, which is uh, they cut the the uh, in the original movie. Right. The uh, Frankenstein throwing a little girl into the river or into the into the lake. 
because that yeah. was reinstated in like 1986. That wasn't, you know, that was taken out like right after the release, I think. So killing Which kids. Which is awesome. I'm on the record being a sh- more kid death in movies. So, you know, commit to it. Kill. <laughs> yeah, fuck them kids. Yeah, either do it or don't. Don't half-ass it like this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you'd have to wait a couple of years until you're actually able to. Then you had to eat your evil killer kids and justifying it. Kid homicide. What? What movie did you guys first see, like, a kid get killed in, and did it, like, shock you? I remember specifically the first one. I was just like, wow, they killed a kid in a movie. I didn't think that was going to happen. Like, ki- like, like, murdered or a kid died? A kid gets killed by something, yes. Like, either my by girl, a monster. On- my girl, absolutely. <laughs> but Bridget <laughs> Ter- yep. yeah, has a twist like that, too, that's really fucked up. What? Bridge to Terabithia? Well, uh, yeah, spoilers. I haven't seen it. Okay, don't tell me. Spoilers I have no idea for my girl. I haven't seen it. No. Oh I come think on, I, I my think girl's I like a thirty-year-old yeah, movie. Yeah, I Sorry, think, spoiler think, uh, fan is up on that. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I have you to watch it for work next week. Ironically, but it's it's one thing to do a kid death in a movie. It's another to do it in a movie that's for kids. True. Yeah, that's, that's a that. whole another thing. Mine is a True. TV movie from the seventies, but now I can't remember. It was like don't. Go in the basement. Don't look in the under the bed. Don't answer the phone. I can't remember what the name of it was. Kid the gets burned alive do. in a. Gets his. Don't do things. He gets his. Uh, uh, don't, do, don't do things. Shoelaces stuck in. You know the car is going to explode and he can't get out. A little kid. He's only like eight years old or something. Like Boom! Burned to death in a car. He burns in the oh, fingers up against the yeah nightmares. <laughs> Ooh. Um, oh my god! Yeah. When I was in uh, kindergarten, they showed us a bus safety video in class, and it like had a kid getting hit by a bus, and it was like a scare tactic to get us to not run out in front of the bus. Did it work? And I was so fucking traumatized by it that my mom like went to the school and like cussed out the principal. But it Did worked. You run in front of the right? bus. Dude. Yeah, you were always I mean, that was I always never, on your I head. I never rode the bus that. to begin with. <laughs> I never rode the bus, so it was never a problem for me. It'll save your life one day, and then you'd be like, "Well, thank God." Well, uh, Paul deals with the creature when they find it by shooting him in the eye. Uh, he shoots his eye out. Big explosion. A gout of blood comes out of him. So this gives us the opportunity. You know, once um, Paul is like, fine, the creature's dead. I'm I'm out of here. Uh, this gives us the opportunity to have Frankenstein bring the creature back again. But this time he's got a black eye. Just a black cornea, you know, thing going on there. And uh, and Frankenstein graduates to brain surgery, uh, where basically he teaches the creature to uh, act like a dog. Yep. He's got him chained up. Stand. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's the thing, like, uh, you know, because, like, the whole idea here, Paul's argument is that what you're doing is inherently evil, right? Because yeah. you're going against the natural order. And Frankenstein's like, we go against the natural order all the time. You know, that's what science, you know, we're incre- you know, developing these things that are, you know, helping people. Um, but I'm like, does the movie, is the movie on Kremp's side or Frankenstein's side with this? Because when the monster is reanimated, the very first thing he does when he takes the bandage off is he tries to strangle Frankenstein. <laughs> is, is murder, yes. His first instinct is murder. Is murder. But. Bravo. Okay, and I don't know if the filmmakers are thinking about this or not. This isn't going to fly in court, Colin. There's no buts. Like well. Murder. Whose brain is it? Uh, it's the the professor's brain. So the first thing that he sees is the guy who kills him. And so he tries oh, to right, strangle right, right. him. Right? That's, I mean, it's like, and his brain's been damaged, I, you know so he's not, but he's like, I remember you. <laughs> I never put that together. Yeah. I, that's, I don't seems think so that's, obvious. I don't think that's what they meant. They were just like, oh, no, he's not? a monster. I feel like we're putting more <laughs> thought into it than they did. Yeah, well, perhaps. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. I that's assume good. that we that's are. Good connection. I think it's probably, it was like, no, it's evil. That's the moral yeah, of the Yeah, I was story. like, you're giving it more credit. I mean, I would appreciate if that was their intent, but I don't think it was. Well, yeah, because there's nothing else to bear this out throughout the uh, the movie. The monster never does talk. Um, eventually, uh, I guess it all kind of comes to a head as, uh, you know, Paul takes off, I think, again. Um, uh, and the maid who's played by Valerie Gaunt because she, w- I mentioned her only because she was Dracula's bride in the ha- a horror Dracula, which came out the following year. Um, right. she tells Frankenstein, like, I know what you've been doing and I'm going to the authorities and to make it even, I am carrying your child and all of this stuff as I'm sitting there listening to it. I'm like, you're just rolling off a list of reasons 
why he's gonna kill you next <laughs> you know it's like why does she, people- she turns into like, she turns into kelly for a second she's like i was right yeah <laughs> yeah this is not going to say you were raped and expect everything to go away. Not again. Yeah, he's going to get her. He's got to get her out of the picture. So he locks her in the room right. with the monster, which I'm like, you know, I mean, now as a kid, you watch that and it's like, well, he puts her in the room with the monster the monster kills her. But now it's like, well, that's a man and she's a woman. And he just locked her in the, you know, he's a feral uh, creature. It's like there's, I guess, implied awfulness, uh, you know, going on there and like whatever happened to her body and all this. Other, but he, she's the reason that he ends up in jail. Uh, sorry, Frankenstein ends up in jail, right? Later, her murder is pinned yeah. on him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Um, and unless everybody was telling. So, you do, know, we, do we assume that she was deposited in the uh, vat of acid that he handed that he has handy in his laboratory? See, I don't know, because uh, th- I'm assuming they couldn't pin the murder of the uh, old German doctor on him because I assume they boiled him in the acid or something. Right. So there was no evidence because that's his whole thing with her is like, what are you going to tell them? What can you prove? They're interested in proof, you know? Yeah. So he's like, you can't pin any of this. I mean, there's no. Do, body. We, do we know the history of uh, vats of acid? When did that begin? When did that? that start being a thing getting rid of bodies and acid i would love to know because it always seems like if you have a vat of like your mad scientist always has like the acid bath Mm -hmm. this is or maybe i'm just all getting this from the other subsequent frankenstein movies sometimes it's under the floor and they have to open the trap door he said this will be gone in a few minutes that's not true it takes like 12 hours to dissolve like a body part in what kind of acid holly (laughs) Yeah, Holly, please. <laughs> like a whole uh, bad episode about this? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I was like, yeah. Yep. It usually takes like two days to dissolve an entire body. Yeah. Does it now? <laughs> it sure uh, does, moments Sean. like this, I'm glad we're over Zoom. <laughs> gotta use a plastic tub, too. We can't use a bathtub. That's right. No. Nope. It's gotta. Are have... we gonna resurrect the thread of uh, us planning to kill one of the freak show? Is that gonna come back, Colin? Oh, yeah, yeah. You remember that? <laughs> remember we used to we used yeah. to plan to kill one of us off like every week. Yeah. I think you were worried, right? Was or no? I was, was worried did... for a while. Yeah. And then I think Tom was worried too. Yeah. Because I think we decided Tom would, or Brent would be the easiest one to kill. Somebody uh-huh. was really easy oh, to kill. Brent would absolutely be the easiest one to kill for sure. I think Brent was the easiest one to kill, and we were threatening it. Yeah. But Sean, we established last week though on our fire in the sky episode you would be the one to run out of the car to the ufo so you should be the most concerned because <laughs> you're, you're a danger to very tr- yeah, I mean, danger i'm to in yourself. danger to kill myself yes yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. but i can see what you two or you three are thinking so. <laughs> i'm just saying if you're willing to check out a ufo it wouldn't be that hard to get you into a vat of acid i don't think very true. what yeah. there's candy in that van <laughs> <laughs> and it was all over i mean maybe yeah, he closed the door and be like, "There's no windows in here. I'm scared." <laughs> well, I guess uh, wrapping up the movie here. I mean, we, uh, you know, we end up um, the Frankenstein. Oh, and then um, um, Elizabeth ends up becoming. Exposed oh yeah, she to- ends up right. She gets down there because I mean, I think he's broken out for like the third time, and and Paul and and uh, Frankenstein are arguing for like the fifth time, and and wrestling on the front. They're like, "Look up there." And there's Frankenstein has made it to the roof and they're like, we must go get him. And so the race is on to save Elizabeth. Yeah. I like the idea that like, um, Frankenstein and like his, um, attitude toward Paul, right? Mm. Paul, at some point you get the idea is like, you know, I don't even know you anymore. Right. You are, you know, this is so off the, beyond the pale that you don't you don't know how bad it is, but like this is inhuman stuff that you're doing, and just the looks that he keeps giving him is like, you know, it's like this is sick, twisted stuff that you're doing, and you just don't know it. Frankenstein, on the other hand, is like always getting this like, you know, Paul's like, I'm done, I'm not working with you anymore, and Frankenstein is always like, but why do you hang around then? Because yeah. you're curious, you want to see what I'm doing. Why are you back here? Because you want to, you know, and so. He never really actually gets to that point where I was like, because I'm like, you know, he need, he does need another brain, right? And there's been like this little buildup of like, you know, Elizabeth isn't safe in the house because, you know, is he at some point in desperation going to go like, well, I need another brain. 
you know, who's the closest person I can turn to? And I'm like, well, it's going to be Paul, right? I mean, basically, yeah, Paul I is thought. advancing himself up through the ranks of viable candidates. Yeah. <laughs> right. I feel, like, I feel like he's just so clueless. Like, he's just so excited to have a science buddy that he can talk about this stuff with. You know, one day Paul's like, fuck you. This is like, this is immoral and I'm done. And he leaves. And then the next day, the Frankenstein's like, oh, I can't wait to show Paul this. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. So- He'll be back. <laughs> He's carving like yeah. like Frankenstein plus Paul onto the monsters. Like, look what I've done for you, <laughs> right? I love you, Paul. Yeah, yeah. Paul's a little um, Paul's a little naive in what he where he thinks Frankenstein's going to go because I'm pretty. There's at one point where like Frankenstein's eyeballing him. It's just like <laughs> when they're talking about brains. It's like, oh, I don't know. Mm. Maybe you, Paul. Yeah, Paul's worst my, scene. Is that me. good cushioning? Like, <laughs> yeah, no, it's solid. <laughs> okay, good. His worst scene to me was when he was talking to Elizabeth, and he's like, uh, you know, it's like she's like, "What are you telling me? He's wicked, insane?" And he's mm-hmm. like, "No, he's not wicked or insane. He's just driven, and he can't see anything." And I'm like, "You are accusing the man of murder. He's wicked." <laughs> At least, <laughs> Classic. Yeah. maybe insane. <laughs> Classic abuser, abusive. Oh, he's just passionate. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, right. But there was you have, the- you have to understand him, like I do. Yeah, <laughs> he has a great mind, which did kind of make me wonder how the end of the movie was going to go. So to get there, but Frankenstein at one point is like. I'll never forgive you for this, Paul. When he's like, I'm going to go to the cops. And then it's like, that's the moment where he's like, oh, shit, I'm not friends with this guy. This guy is my enemy. <laughs> you know, yeah. he's been telling me he's my enemy the whole fucking movie. But like, no, no, no. But I think at that point, Frankenstein's like, oh, he actually does mean me harm. And then they have to go right when they're about to punch each other out or whatever. Uh, they got to go rescue Elizabeth. And they burn the creature alive with a, of course, you throw the, uh, oh, yeah. That's the other thing. When, when Frankenstein's shooting, he gets a gun. He shoots uh, at the creature who is holding Elizabeth and shoots her. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Actually, he doesn't care. He's like, bam, bam. And he gets the creature who, of course, is unfazed by it. And then he has to he burns him with the uh, the oil lamp. And conveniently, the creature falls into a vat of acid, which means there's not going to be any uh, no evidence. And so yep. the the framing story of this whole movie is uh, Frankenstein's been relating this story from prison, the dungeon, <laughs> right? As he's awaiting his execution. And that's yes. when Paul actually does show up at the end, which is a ballsy move for a guy to go see the guy who you're basically condemning to death. Uh, yes. You know, and, you know, that's where I was like, is Paul going to go with the like, well, you know, what the knowledge that he has in his head is more important and I need to save his life and tell the truth about what happened or... I'm going to let him hang or in this case, get beheaded for his, yes. you know, transgresses against nature. And he goes, with, yep. I'm going to let him get beheaded. Just I'm as gonna let him die. Yeah. His sideways um, looks at the uh, priest is, uh, you know, it's like when he's like, but my creature was doing it. And Paul just kind of looks at the preacher like, uh huh. Do you see? Yeah, you see do you what, see the yeah, madness? The madness. <laughs> uh, the one thing I I liked about this because you're right. Um, this is this is a whole flashback story. We start with Frankenstein in jail, uh, telling his story to a priest, and I did like like he really tries to convince the priest to stay there. He like he's cr- crazy at this point, and the priest was like, "Okay, okay, go ahead, give me your tale." And then I thought it was so funny when Frankenstein he like puts his knee up and he's like. Well, I guess it started when I was a small boy. <laughs> and and I, I thought that was the funniest because he's like, this whole time he's like, I'll be dead in an hour if no one hears this story. And then he's like, well, it started back when I was very young lad. <laughs> I always thought that was the funniest thing. You gotta like, the- I was born on a Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. It was a snowy day. Yeah. I wonder if that's also a part of the thing. Like, I mean, that's in the novel is also like a flashback, right? Except Frankenstein's telling his story to uh, the, the sea captain, w- Walton. Right at mm. the beginning and at the end, and then the creature shows up. But nope, in this right. one, no surprise ending. The creature is gone, and Frankenstein is led to his uh, death at the guillotine. Or is he, or is he Colin? That's right, because we didn't actually see it, Sean, did we? We didn't. This is, we just went I, to I'm pretty sure that stunt person died, though. <laughs> yes. Which one? <laughs> the one that fell through the window and then into a vat of acid. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah While yeah, wearing yeah. a bunch of makeup. <laughs> He might be dead. Yeah, that also again stunt work in this. 
Peter well, Cushing something else back then. Peter Cushing is his own stunt man too. Like I mean, in some of the other movies, you know, well, I guess the, the the Dracula movies where he's more animated as Van Helsing, he's swinging around sets and leaping across. Things. He does an Evil of Frankenstein. They, like he's grabbing onto ropes and swinging. Like this guy's like Errol Flynn. Like you don't think of <laughs> Grand Moff Tarkin as like the Errol Flynn of right, swinging the from 1950s. chandeliers. And shit. Yeah, but he is. He does. He does. He loves swinging from a curtain. Yeah. Guy's a fucking legend. Like, you know, I mean, we really, <laughs> if you just know him from Star Wars, you're missing out. <laughs> it's very true. That's very He's true. Dr. Frankenstein. <laughs> what was it? He said five times, five, five times as Dr. Frankenstein. Yep. Yeah. But only, I think, three times as Van Helsing out of eight Dracula movies. But okay. All right. We've, we've talked about this enough. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, what we're going to do, listener, we're going to go around the table and we're going to tell you whether or not uh, we would recommend that you watch this movie, The Curse of Frankenstein. But first of all, we're going to read some of your mail. And in order to do that, we're going to need the help of our mailman. His name is Igor, I, pr- appropriately. Igor, bring us the mail. Masters, masters, the mail. I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising, rising. Why, thank you, Igor. Igor is a nice little pea coat on today. Oh, he Igor. Looks, he looks dead. I had to clap five times to get your ass in here. What's happening? He was One getting all the buttons fastened on that coat. There's a uh, lot. <laughs> All right. Sorry, Igor. Igor is upset that uh, diminutive hunchback assistants were not represented in this version of uh, Frankenstein. Well, uh, not all about you, Igor. <laughs> Damn, Holly. He gets once a week, okay? <laughs> Jeez. Let's make it about him once a week. Fine. <laughs> okay. Well, um, we want to tell you where you can reach us. And again, this is also just a reminder, uh, listener request month is coming up. So you can uh, find us on uh, the social medias to make those requests and write into us about next week's episode or this week's episode. If you want to uh, ask us a question. Anyway, you can find or us. Any episode you want. Whatever. Yeah, why not? Uh, we read them all. Uh, but anyway, you can find us on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Saturday Freak Show. Twitter at Sat Freak Show. You can email us Saturday Freak Show Yahoo.com. Or you can find us on Instagram at Saturday Night Freak Show about tonight's movie, The Curse of Frankenstein. Nelson Nashimento writes in and says, Early on, I preferred Dracula, but I've come to love the Frankenstein series just as much. Both start strong with some good sequels, but in the end, both also lose steam going to some strange places, but at least old Victor Frankenstein. Never wound up doing kung fu. I mean, is that a good thing? Right. Yes. I was going to say, what, uh, <laughs> no, what are on. you yes. saying there? That the Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires. Sean, were you here for Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires? Yes, we I have that. seen the Seven Golden Vampires. <laughs> I, w- I just rewatched it again. Uh, not to this year. <laughs> had a good had a good time? I like that movie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we could it, always write it. Yeah, we could. So, <laughs> Mikhail and I never have experience never. of writing Frankenstein. Frankenstein, very true. the kung fu. I'm sure there is. I mean, obviously the character's been around. I think they said. Um, oh no, I'm sorry. Dracula is like one of the most, and Sherlock Holmes are one of the most uh, made portrayed. characters, portrayed characters in movies. But I'm sure Frankenstein's got to be up there, and somewhere there is like a Chinese kung fu Frankenstein. But I guarantee it. Don't know what it is, but I'm sure it's out there. Uh, uh, Carson Snar writes in and says, I've always wanted to watch all of these Hammer classics. They're on my endless watch later list. Well, Carson, I mean, come on. Let's, uh, you, yeah, you, should, should, you need to give him a watch. If you're playing along with the Saturday Night Freak Show, that means you watched it for this episode. Um, mm-hmm. Customers also watched says, I love the Hammer Frankenstein movies. There you go. There you go. About uh, last week's episode, which was Fire in the Sky, Michael Whitaker says, I should have said it on my last post, but I'm a little surprised you guys would do this one. It's two actual science fiction scenes, and the rest is sort of a missing person's drama. Mm. Well, well we most of us had never seen it, so we didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, and didn't we, did we talk about that on the show or after the show? Yeah, or we like, did. Yeah, okay. So you got to listen to that episode. We, we covered it. 
Um, Matthew Pearson writes in and says, I love this movie. It freaked me out as a kid. Um, you were not alone. Yes. Uh, Matthew. Uh, we were all freaked. And the um, previous week, we watched John Carpenter's Body Bags. Uh, Travis Legler writes in and says, while listening to your John Carpenter's Body Bags podcast and talking about people walking in on movies at the wrong time, uh, he says, I immediately saw and this uh, meme from Reanimator, where you know the doctor's uh, going down on <laughs> Barbara Crampton, and thought of you guys. <laughs> oh so, <laughs> Jesus! So does that mean somebody walked in on that particular sensitive moment, and uh, yeah, backed out of the room like Homer Simpson? Yeah, I'm gonna back out of the room right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all for writing in. Uh, now we're going to go around the room and tell you if you should watch the movie, starting with Michaela. What did you think about the curse of Frankenstein? Well, we watched another Hammer, the curse of movie directed by the same guy earlier this year called The Curse of the Werewolf. And that was a really great movie. This one yeah. didn't enjoy as much as that one. Um, I liked the design of Frankenstein. I liked the makeup. Um, I really thought the makeup actually looked really good, especially for the time period. And I was surprised that it held up pretty well in like, I don't know if it, I don't want to say HD, but on Amazon streaming, it, it wasn't like, oh, there's the obvious like makeup scenes, like some other things we've watched. I thought it looked pretty good. Mm. Um, I feel like this is territory we've treaded on a lot and we tread on a lot lately and, uh, they're all starting to blend together for me. Um, these like kind of like in a castle Jesus, Colin. hammer <laughs> pushing stuff like <laughs> like we've watched a lot of it lately and they're all blending together. Um, this one just dragged a little bit too much for me. I didn't really find anything too new and exciting about it. So I think I'm going to have to pass. I don't hate this movie. It wasn't offensive. It just didn't captivate me. That's all. So I think I'm going to pass on this one. Um, let's see. Sean, what did you think? <laughs> I'm always the second. Always. <laughs> um, uh, the Curse of Frankenstein. Um, this is, um, uh, well, I'll just say right off the bat, I really like this movie. Um, I watched, I had to watch this for work one day and I hadn't seen, I hadn't seen much of the Hammer films or, um, uh, and, or any of the Frankenstein ones at this point. So this was my first introduction to the Hammer Frankenstein series. And I really liked it. And I've seen a couple other ones too. Um, the next one, uh, the revenge of Frankenstein. Um, and I think another one, a couple more down the line in this, but I really do like Peter Cushing as Frankenstein. Um, I kind of like the stories they delve into, uh, in the other movies. Um, uh, the next one's good. Again, he's a son of a bitch as well, but, um, the, uh, you guys, you think you'll ever watch, Revenge of Frankenstein. At the end of it, he like he himself gets his. Oh come on! All right, fine, I won't say it. But it's like the continuation of the story of Frankenstein. Is his um, brain is, in the monster? Is that it? No comment. Uh, it, it is. It is a good continuation. It's as a much good as they series. Riff on these movies and Young Frankenstein, I think I get it. Well, he starts. Okay. He starts transplanting souls by the time yeah, he, he gets does to a uh, Frankenstein uh, created soul? woman. Yeah, he soul. isolates the soul and s tries to do. It's like it's not, he's not making a monster necessarily every time. It's uh yeah. See, he, I'm almost more interested in this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you got to keep going. They're all different. <laughs> they are. They are all different. It isn't the same thing and you know it, it, i think in the next one he, he he's his he succeeds and he creates a man and it's actual like a dude but he you know against the tyranny it's a i think it's a really good story um i totally get how um yeah we've tread this ground a lot and so and they do all they can all start um blending together and i think like you can watch a couple of these, I think, and be like, all right, those are pretty cool. But I think you have to like really enjoy this aesthetic, uh, aesthetic and storytelling to like get in and go through all of them. Um, but uh, I mean, as far as Curse of Frankenstein goes, like I, uh, I really enjoy this movie. Um, there's a lot going throughout, um, you know, that keeps me interested. I mean, from people almost stunting people almost dying to the very colorful laboratory scenes. Um, I'm a big fan of this movie and of this particular uh, franchise of Frankenstein. So I'm going to recommend The Curse of Frankenstein. I'm going to recommend uh, The Revenge of Frankenstein as well. Um, I enjoy that movie too. 
so yeah, I think you should. I think this is a uh, a little bit uh, above um, most of the other stuff that we've come across on this show. But yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoy it, so I recommend The Curse of Frankenstein. Holly, <laughs> thank you, Sean. Um, mm-hmm. I, I yeah, there was there was a few things in this that. Um, that I appreciated. I was not aware like his historically that this was, um, a big step in color for horror movies. That's, that was an interesting tidbit, Colin. Thank you for, for sharing that with us. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, I, I like some of the imagery. I thought the lab, like Sean, you were saying the colorful lab. And I, I really enjoy that mad sciencey kind of, kind of aesthetic. I think it's very cool. Um, but other than the imagery, like it, I, I agree with Michaela that this movie doesn't really give us anything new. I mean, I realized back then it did. It, it, you know, it did give us some new elements that weren't um, weren't done before, as far as Frankenstein and film. Um, but watching it now, it doesn't really give much um, at all, really. As even not just not just with Frankenstein, but just. It was boring. The storytelling is just like, I didn't, I don't know. I didn't know where they were, what, like what the motivation was. Like a lot of, I was like, what am I supposed to care about right now? Am I supposed to care about Frankenstein? Am I supposed to like understand what he's feeling? Like, I don't know. I just, I, it didn't really, it didn't really jive with me. I thought it was pretty much just kind of a, a bore fest. I don't know. Maybe these movies aren't really my thing. Who knows? But I, I think if you're, if you're looking for like the the historical aspect of it, then you might want to check it out. Otherwise, I think you're probably safe to pass on this one. Yeah, can't recommend. Colin. Well, it's no surprise. I love this movie, and I'm totally going to recommend it. I think uh, the thing, I guess, to me, <clears throat> you know, and again, I think uh, you know, Sean was saying the uh, I am the person who l- digs this aesthetic. Um, you know, you're talking about like, is there bleed? You know, I think what uh, you were saying is, you know, we this year alone, I think on the Saturday Night Freak Show, we did, you know, this one, we did the Vincent Price Haunted Palace, we did the Curse of the Werewolf. So we've been kind of in one year, I think this is probably more of these old movies than you guys are used to watching. <laughs> where yes. I'm like watching this shit all the time, <laughs> right? So they are, they I have a different so. personality. To me, this one uh, of the Frankenstein series, um, I think, I don't know if it's necessarily my favorite, but I think it's probably the best. Um, I thought that it was because of the, and again, I guess, you know, if you heard the conversation that we were having, I think because of the psychological layers that at least I'm reading into uh, the characters. I mean, we spent like a lot of time talking about like the actual characters in the movie. You know, and like what they were doing and what they were after and all this, which I think is makes the Frankenstein series of Hammers, you know, better than their Draculas, Uh, because Dracula, unfortunately, even though Christopher Lee is very cool as Dracula, there's not really much to those. It feels like it's like, you know, somebody wakes him up and then he kills a bunch of people and then somebody stakes him at the end. And it just kind of seems like you're watching the same thing on a loop. Um, but the Frankenstein movies actually do explore new, you know, things each time around the frameworks the same, you know, doctors is, you know, on the run from the law and he has an assistant and they're after some goal. And, you know, so I guess there's that, but it's like generally the philosophical, uh, component and the ethical and the moral uh, uh, questions that just the whole idea of, you know, we're going to uh, illegally do these experiments in the name of science, you know, uh, ends up giving us more possible, more dramatic possibilities, you know, in some ways. And so I think that's why, even though I, I personally am a bigger Dracula fan, I think for the hammer cycle, I think the, the Frankenstein movies are the way to go. Um, I would recommend, um, of the Frankenstein series, I'd say there's Curse. Evil of Frankenstein might be actually my favorite, even though I think it's lesser regarded by a lot of, you know, like uh, Hammer film aficionados. But I think I, I would, I would, you even say you could start with that one. Um, 
And uh, I know people that don't think like Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell, the last one, but I really enjoyed that one. And then I'd go Frankenstein created woman, Frankenstein must be destroyed, and Revenge of Frankenstein. And then the one I didn't like was the uh, the horror of Frankenstein. So, um, yeah, I mean, if you're into, you know, these kind of, um, yeah, just the historical positioning of, of Hammer, I guess also, you know, really intrigues me. We watched a movie that basically had four sets. Right. Did you notice that they had like the foyer, the living room, the laboratory? I mean, was that it? Like <laughs> the whole thing. So this, is a, this is like one bedroom. Yeah. Very inexpensively at Bray Studios, you know, which is the uh, that's where the uh, Oakley Court. That's where the Rocky Horror uh, Picture Show was shot. That's the, that is Castle Frankenstein, you know, um, and that's been used in, I don't know, they said the several hundred movies over the years sure. uh, before Hammer moved out of it in the mid 60s, I believe. But, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, you know, I really, really enjoy this movie. Uh, I think, you know, we're in good company if you like it. Martin Scorsese likes this movie. Guillermo del Toro likes it. You know, it's like, I think this is a, a formative uh, movie in the horror genre, in gore cinema and color horror in the Frankenstein mythos. I think it's very different than the, the universal one. So, I mean, you are getting, even though it's a, the same concept at very different interpretations. Uh, yeah, I would wholeheartedly recommend that you watch <laughs> the curse of Frankenstein. Uh, so I guess it's split decision, split decision of whether or not you actually yep. have to see it. Um, so next week we are going to watch a movie, which is chosen by, John, what are we watching next week? Uh, next week, we will be watching some Christmas weirdness, uh, a movie that uh, I have not seen. So we're in for an adventure. We'll be watching Blood Beat. Oh, I saw that was on Shutter. I've been trying to get okay. it to play, but I've been having playback errors on my fire stick. I can't watch it. So I may have to watch well, it on my go. fucking computer. What year is this from? It's 80. <sighs> Seven. Okay. <laughs> All will be revealed next week. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess I, I shouldn't watch uh, I think it then. It's the uh, 80s. Yeah. Don't watch it yeah, until next week. I think it's okay. the 80s. Um, I'm pretty sure. And Vinegar Syndrome put this one out. There you go. There's a little plug, even though we're not getting paid for it. Vinegar Syndrome. If you it's, wanna... it's, uh, oh, I think it's going to get weird. It's going to get weird, folks. Yeah. That's what it sounds like. I like when I get weird. Not even going to tell it's you getting, what the synopsis get weird. is. Um, <laughs> also, keeping a running tally of every Vinegar Syndrome movie Sean brings. I know. <laughs> I you know, oh, man, I had this pegged before. Okay. Before the vinegar syndrome thing, and but there's an article on Bloody Disgusting that like, came out like yesterday. I had this pegged two weeks ago, or maybe even three weeks ago. My buddy, uh, uh oh, never mind. I was gonna say my buddy uh, suggested Is this the it same again. Person but we don't suggested have offerings. <laughs> Everything will be revealed next week. Yes. So that's a yes. All right. I'm already not gonna like this movie. I feel right. like. No, I think you'll like. I don't know. Maybe you won't. I don't know. We'll find out. Well, we'll make a plug for Warner Archive also, who just put out yes. a two-disc uh, restored edition of The Curse of Frankenstein, so you can pick that one yeah. up, too. Warner. Yeah. Sean, tell your friend, Sean, tell your friend to save it for listener picks like everybody else. <laughs> but he knows he's got the direct in, so he's just like... And he, see, he's but this is supposed to be sickness. your pick, Sean, not his. I watched the trailer, and I was like, I want to pick this. So it is my pick. <laughs> well, right. If it fails, it's his pick. As Sean says, next week all will be revealed here on the Saturday Night Freak Show, ladies and germs. So until then, the basement is going dark. <laughs> <laughs>